This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So good morning. Um, we're going to start out early with a quiz, but um, it won't be too hard. So this is my uh, task for today, is to talk about selecting patients with asymptomatic carotid lesions based on survival predictions, or to revise that topic so that it actually fits on the slide, treatment based on survival prediction, asymptomatic carotid stenosis. These are my disclosures. Uh, in this talk, I'm not going to be referring to anything off-label, at least that I'm aware of. OK, so if everybody has their little clickers, you have a patient with an asymptomatic 90% carotid stenosis. This patient should not undergo intervention unless his or her life expectancy is one year or more, two years or more, five years or more. OK, all right. Excellent. We'll come back to this. now. An 82-year-old patient with a 90% left carotid stenosis referred to you. The patient's asymptomatic, underwent cabbage six years ago, doesn't smoke anymore, doesn't take a statin because it made him have muscle pain, his creatinine is slightly elevated, he's not diabetic, he's fairly active, plays golf, swims. Your recommendation for this patient is carotid endarterectomy, carotid stenting, or best medical therapy. That doesn't stand for bone marrow transplant. Best medical therapy. Which of those three is your preference? All right, so <laughs> good, we have some work to do. So um, uh, we'll come back to that at the end as well. So I think that actually this is not really the hardest topic in the world, because I suspect everybody in this room believes that some assessment of the patient's survival capacity should be incorporated into any operative decision. I mean, I think if I just put up that uh, quiz or that question, everybody would say, yes, you should incorporate survival estimates. We are uh, accustomed to assessing, focusing our assessment for risk in, in the decision analysis to intervene when the patient has an asymptomatic carotid stenosis on their clinical state, the degree of the stenosis, to some degree plaque morphology, and to some degree progression of stenosis if there is a history uh, to the lesion that is available. And as I said, I think all of us incorporate some degree of an eyeball test of does the patient look like this makes sense to do. The real question is, can you quantify that eyeball assessment, and how specifically should you try to quantify it? If you look at the current treatment recommendations for asymptomatic disease, endarterectomy, there's le generally level one evidence, except for the very last one, which refers to the substitution of carotid stinting for endarterectomy. But endarterectomy is considered reasonable for asymptomatic stenosis in the appropriate size range only if it can be performed with a complication rate of less than 3% and bearing in mind that it primarily benefits men and those, at least in this level of uh, data, with a life expectancy of greater than five years, hence everybody's choice in that quiz question. But everybody is also aware of the controversies related to the, those uh, recommendations that the studies have, you know, d depending upon who you are, not been optimally designed for a variety of reasons. That best medical therapy at the initiation of studies was, is not the same as best medical therapy now, and that change in treatment options, particularly the introduction of stinting, affects the risk-benefit balance in determining whether or not a patient should undergo some treatment. I'm not going to talk about any of those controversies, which would take up the next month, and we still wouldn't be able to come to a conclusion as to whether or not the, our best data are still relevant. But I am going to talk about what to do with, with this issue of a life expectancy that should be reasonable in order to justify the intervention. So how does one go about trying to predict survival for the patients who are uh, undergoing carotid or might be undergoing carotid endarterectomy?
So this is a study from Conrad et al. published last year in which they looked at about 1,800 patients. They did count uh, two sides sometimes, which is a little perhaps suboptimal. They have uh, quite a good overall stroke, ipsilateral stroke and mortality rate and an actual, not actuarial, but actual survival of 73% at five years. And to the, on the right of the slide, you see the factors that they identified that correlated with the patient's survivability. None of these are particularly surprising. Maybe this is a little uh, surprising, and particularly with the odds ratio that, it, it, that they encountered. But none of the other factors would, would come as a surprise to anybody who is assessing the risk of a patient for a procedure, whether it's carotid or any other vascular procedure. What they then did was they took the odds ratio and rounded it up, I think, to the nearest tenth or something, and then created a score. And if the patient's score was zero to five, their five-year survival was about 93%. They worked their way all the way up to greater than 15, where the survival was about 34%, or two out of three would uh, not make it through the five years. Now that, you might say to yourself, okay, I know where I'm drawing my line. You might pick here, some of you might pick here. But if you do pick here, you have to think to yourself that one out of every two patients that you would say no to on the basis of their predicted survival, likelihood of surviving five years would actually survive that five years. So that might not be the best of all systems for estimating the, the for justifying your decision to deny treatment so another group um, looked at the same thing, trying to predict survival of patients with asymptomatic stenosis. They had a bigger patient group, 4,000 patients. They didn't provide their particular stroke and death rates, but they had an 82% five-year survival. They did the same thing and looked at the factors that correlated with survival. And as you can see, most of these are the same as you saw on the other slide. So that's sort of reassuring that when people look for what's predictive, that at least they have the same factors, the weight of the factor may vary substantially, and this one didn't show up on the earlier study. They also did the same thing where they put these factors together and created a low risk group, which was, I think, less than or equal to two minor risk factors. The minor risk factors are listed here. Their median risk group, which had a survival of 80% in five years, could have one major risk factor and as many as three, I think, minor, or as, as, met, as a maximum of three minor risk factors. And then the high risk group, which was 51% five-year survival, could have three of the major risk factors and some other combinations that you can see listed there. But again, you'd say to yourself, well, eh, I'm in the, the circumstances where if I say no to someone in this group, I'm going to be right 50% of the time and that's all. When they uh, plotted their predicted risk of survival or predicted survival for these various risk categories and their actual survival, their, their mathematical model was actually quite good. So they seemed to be matching what they thought would happen with what did happen. The, qu the quandary still is, is that accurate enough for you to use that in determining treatment for the patient? A final uh, study that attempted the same thing looked at about 500 patients, again with a good overall stroke and mortality rate and enough patients surviving to assess, identified roughly the same factors, a few of them fell off here, and with slightly different weights. They had sort of a binary approach to predicting mortality, and they looked at only three-year mortality. If your score was less than or equal to two, you had a pretty low three-year mortality. If it was greater than two, again, you were in the 30% um, mortality range. So it's reasonable and seems consistent from group to group to identify those factors that correlate with uh, risk of death during the follow-up interval but the, the specificity of identifying which patient sitting in front of you should not undergo the uh, procedure is still somewhat um, imprecise. The same group in a different uh, publication, different study, actually looked at, well, what happens if you do operate on patients with asymptomatic stenoses who are in the high-risk group. Now, you're probably all sitting there thinking, well, that doesn't happen. Nobody would operate on an asymptomatic patient who's high-risk. Well, you'd be surprised. So what they did was they looked at about six or seven 
life-limiting conditions. And they used the estimates, mortality estimates at three and five years that were established by other groups treating those life-limiting conditions. So they couldn't really be accused of underestimating or overestimating the uh, mortality risk for that condition in that patient group. And then they looked to see what were the outcomes of carotid endarterectomy in pa patients with these life-limiting conditions who underwent carotid endarterectomy. So probably you would say to yourself, well, there's not going to be enough patients to actually assess this. Not exactly. The, these, the, of 12, they didn't operate on 12,000 asymptomatic high-risk patients, but of the 12,000 patients in the study group, they found a fair number of patients who actually did undergo carotid endarterectomy. You have to um, take some of these high-risk conditions with, or the definition of that with a little grain of salt. This is ASA class four. I don't know about you all, but for us, our anesthesiologists don't start counting before three and a half for most of the vascular patients. So I'm not sure that this is particularly discriminating of uh, anything that would be helpful in assessing the appropriateness of endarterectomy in these patients. But what they observed, again, not surprisingly, if a patient is at high risk, bad things happen more often. So the risk of stroke and death and the combined endpoint was greater in those patients who have life-limiting conditions than in patients who don't. This would seem to be fairly straightforward, but it also means that there is a lot of carotid endarterectomies being performed in patients who, if someone else, particularly someone with the purse strings, was looking at the appropriateness, they might say, what were you thinking? So. I kind of like this little, um, you know, everybody, at some point, someone will put a formula to something and try and, and figure out what it actually, what actually is the length of time that somebody needs to live in order to benefit from carotid and carotid treatment. In this case, it's uh, predominantly endarterectomy that they were thinking of. This formula, I put in the words of re relative to uh, carotid treatment, but the formula could be used for anything. The critical life expectancy, meaning how long do you have to live to make this worthwhile, is related to the probability of the event that you're uh, trying to have an impact on. So in this case, periprocedural stroke, the annual stroke rate if you didn't have intervention and the annual stroke rate that you have after the intervention, assuming, of course, that it's been um, effective. If you take that formula and work your way through the various trials using their uh, risk of the, that they encountered in their treatment or in their best medical management at that time, you, what you find is kind of intriguing. The amount of, the length of time you have to live in order to benefit from the operation has increased as the baseline event rate has gone down. So if you assume that the, you have to meet a risk rate of 3% or less in, for periprocedural events and with best medical therapy, the baseline risk of stroke is 1%, right now, the calculation from this formula, if you, if you believe it, is that you have to live at least six years in order to gain the benefit from carotid endarterectomy if, if for a patient with asymptomatic disease. So, if you go back to our little patient from the very beginning and use these three different uh, groups approach to estimating risk, this is what you calculate. From the first study, the patient's score would be 15, survival is 34%, you would say maybe no. From Waller, they're in the medium risk group, 80% survival, you would say yes. From Alcacer et al., their score is three, that's greater than two, their survival is 70%, so that's a maybe. So <laughs> that sort of summarized the quandary that we're in. Can we use survival prediction to guide treatment? Yes, we can. Should we use it? Yes, we should, and everybody in this room does to some degree, but how do we use it? I don't think anybody exactly has a clue. There is no magic formula for this. It's quite likely that if we don't figure out how to do it with some precision, someone else will figure it out for us, and it probably will be even worse. Uh, thank you very much.